Hey guys, Eric here, Mr. Fired Up Wealth, and today I want to talk to you about what I call the new oil. And I've been talking about this for a while. If you follow the channel, if you follow Facebook, Patreon, what I'm talking about when I say the new oil, I believe that we're in a new industrial revolution. Well, this time it's technology. When you think of the original industrial revolution, of course, everything, the entire economy ran on oil. And, and oil is still important to our economy in some aspects. But when you think about the digital transformation of today and you think of Internet of Things and you think of 5G and you think of autonomous vehicles and data center and cloud and all those different things that are driving the work from anywhere economy and this new stay at home economy from COVID, you're really talking about the new oil, which is semiconductors. Look at your phone, your iPad, the computer you're watching me on, the monitor, the phone you're watching me on, whatever. Everything that is electronic, that literally has electronics from kids' toys to calculators to autonomous vehicles, everything in between, all your Alexa devices, they run with semiconductors. And sometimes 5, 10, 20, 100 semiconductors in one item, like a car. So when you think about that, that trend is not going anywhere. These secular growth trends are being fueled by the new oil, which is semiconductors. So I'm excited to announce a new video series focused solely on semiconductors. Today, this video, I'm going to cover my top three mid-cap semiconductor companies that are small enough where they, you know, they, they, they have a good reputation, they've got a really good business model, and I think they can get to the next level to be that next large cap. So I'm gonna talk about those three companies today, and then there's gonna be a couple other videos that are gonna talk about semiconductors as well. So you're gonna to wanna to see this series. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, please go ahead and hit the bottom right-hand corner. There's a little subscribe button. There's also a little bell you need to click to get notifications. I'm excited to get this started. So without further ado, let's get going. All right, guys, let's get started here. Before I go on, I do want to mention something. In case you're a history buff, I did say earlier the original Industrial Revolution. Now, technically, the original Industrial Revolution would have been coal and then oil, but you get my drift. It's fossil fuels. What I'm saying is that I think semiconductors will take over fossil fuels like coal and oil as what drives the economy moving forward. So before we get started, I'm going to give you my top three mid cap stocks. And the reason those are great is because they have the chance to grow into a large cap stock. They're you know, a nice enough size where they have stability, they've got some good leadership, they've got some good things going for momentum, they've got some small dividends so they can be in your DGIF bucket. But they also have a lot of secular growth trends behind them as tailwinds that I could actually charge them into a larger cap and actually make you some money as an investor. Everybody talks about the same stocks like Nvidia and AMD and there's a bunch of them out there. And those are great companies and I own those stocks, but these mid cap ones are kind of off the radar and you're gonna to wanna to see what these picks are. In fact, I'm gonna rank these in order and usually I don't do them in order. Usually they're just random. This time I'm gonna go three, two, one. And my number one pick, you'll be surprised because I've never actually talked about the stock before and it's something I'm now looking to add to my portfolio after doing this research. Before I get into my top three mid-cap semiconductor stocks, I wanna give you some information, some background about semiconductors, because this is going to be a series. So again, subscribe to the channel so that you do not miss any of these videos coming up on semiconductors. There's a website called semiconductors.org, which has a lot of excellent information on it. And I encourage you to do some additional due diligence because you could spend hours on the site getting some great information and insights into the semiconductor industry. So what I'm looking at right here is actually from that website, and it's the 2020 State of the U.S. Semiconductor Industry by the Semiconductor Industry Association, or SIA. This introduction is really cool, and I, I wanted to read it to you. So with transistors 10,000 times thinner than a human hair, so small that billions can fit on a chip the size of a quarter, today's semiconductors are the triumph of innovation and a hallmark of America's technological prowess. Pretty powerful statement there. You can see the quarter um, on the right-hand side of your screen, and you can see actually a semiconductor chip that has you know, t transistors on here that are 10,000 times thinner than a human hair, and it's so small that you can fit on a chip the size of a quarter. I mean, it's just it's incredible technology. So I'm just gonna read this real quick because there's a lot of good information in here. It says, US companies have for decades led the world in producing these tiny chips that power modern technologies. 
Our country's leadership in semiconductors is a big reason America has the world's largest economy and most advanced te technologies. And a lot of people probably don't really think of it that way. Since the onset in early 2020 of the COVID pandemic, semiconductor enabled technology has been deployed to find treatments, care for patients, work and study from home, order groceries and other essential products. And this is what we talked about in the beginning. It's all about the digital economy, digital transformation, stay at home economy, work from home economy, work from anywhere economy, digital revolution. It's, it's here, you know, 10 years of, you know, cloud and, and digitalization actually happened in 10 weeks. It's just amazing the acceleration that it's occurred, exponential acceleration in these, these secular growth, growth trends. It's a reminder of the importance of semiconductors in responding to the world's most urgent challenges and crisis. The world runs on semiconductors, and yes, semiconductors need electricity, and oil can make electricity, but there's a lot of other sustainable energies now that are making electricity, and so semiconductors to me are taking over that role within the world economy as the new oil. The U.S. semiconductor industry has continued to maintain its global leadership position in semiconductor technologies essential for the future, including our artificial intelligence, or AI, quantum computing, and advanced wireless networks such as 5G. Those are some of the greatest secular growth trends of our lifetime, and semiconductors power those. And this is, this is really good information. It really lets it sink into your brain. The U.S. semiconductor industry has also maintained the global market share leadership, even though worldwide year-over-year -year sales growth in 2019 was actually negative, which a lot of people probably don't realize, and has kept steady its very high levels of research and development and CapEx, capital expenditure. So the next part over here talks about, and I'll scroll down so you can see, these industry investments have sustained U.S. leadership in semiconductor innovation. U.S. companies are leaders in 5G technology and have developed virtually all advanced semiconductors relevant for AI and big data, which power everything from supercomputers to internet data centers. So if you're into WCLD and all the cloud picks, even Amazon Web Services, Datadog, Splunk, Fastly, all those different stocks that we talk about on Fired Up Wealth, they need semiconductors to work, guys. This is really powerful stuff. And you can go on and on here. It talks about some of the challenges that we face because of the pandemic. There's risk with China, uh, you know, trying to become a bigger player in the space. Also risk with geopolitical events and trade tensions. So read through this if you're interested. There's a lot of great information on here. I'm just going to skim kind of through a little bit of this. For example, 2019 demand by end use. You've got communications, and it shows you a total value at the bottom in billions, 136 billion. Computers, consumer, automotives, so when you think of automotive, autonomous vehicles, but even all your new cars that have driver assist, you know, lane change, tells you if you're, you know, if you're driving too close to the person in front of you. All the new cars have those technologies. All those technologies run off semiconductors. When you think of a Tesla, a Tesla has 100 microchips in it that's doing things across the entire car. Um, sensors, especially if it's an autonomous self-driving type car, it needs tons of semiconductors for that to work. Industrial, government, and so on. This is kind of an interesting snapshot of where semiconductors are manufactured across the United States. Anything in blue is where there's actually plants that, that build semiconductors or equipment. So you can see Minnesota here, most of the East Coast, most of the West Coast and the South, not so much you know, in the Dakotas and Montana and some of the central U.S., but I thought that was interesting. There's more states than you maybe would think at first, at first glance. You know, this again is talking about, this is, this is a really important part here. So top U.S. exports in 2019. Number one was aircraft. Well, Boeing's not really, you know, exporting a lot of planes right now because of COVID. So that probably is going to change significantly when you see this 2020 report at the end of this year. So it's refined oil, which is also going to be down because of demand. I mean, you can see what the oil stocks have done. So you've got refined oil at 94 billion, crude oil at 65 billion, automobiles at 48 billion, and then semiconductors at 46 billion. This semiconductors are the fifth largest export in 2019. And how are these numbers going to be impacted by COVID? It'd be very interesting to see. My prediction is that over the next 10 years, that our US exports and semiconductors will overtake oil or at least become much closer to it as one of our top exports 
but the, the message I'm trying to drive home here is that semiconductors are what's going to power the digital, the globalized digital, digital economy. You know, from the microphone that I'm talking into to the camera you're watching me from, the computer, everything. Just look around you. Just right now, look around your room, your house, wherever you're at, your car. You know, your phone has microchips. Your kids' toys have microchips. Almost anything with electric current these days is going to have semiconductors and microchips in it. So very powerful stuff. And you can see the U.S. right now, it, this is percent of U.S. headquartered firm semiconductor uh, wafer capacity by location. The U.S. you know, still dominates that at 44%. Singapore is in there at 17.4%. China is only 5.6%, but they're you know, working hard to change that. Uh, and the industry really has been impacted significantly because of Huawei. So there's a lot of things that have happened um, because of the trade tensions, because of you know, the relationship with Huawei. And a lot of these companies, including the companies I'm going to talk to you today about, they had to make some severe pivots in their, in, in their organization in order to remain successful and profitable. Without further ado, again, I'm going to get into the top three mid-cap semiconductor stocks. You're going to want to see all three picks. All three of these have tremendous potential and something that you should consider in your portfolio. So without further ado, let's get started. All right, number three, and remember, we're gonna go in order. So we're gonna go three, two, one, and you're gonna to wanna to see the other two picks, especially my number one, so do stay tuned. Number three is Corvo, not to be confused with Quavo. And this one actually does not have a dividend, but I promise the other two do. So this would not be a DGIF, of course, since it doesn't have dividend. It does have kind of a higher PE ratio at about 38.6. The PEG ratio on a five year is 3.15. It's a mid cap, medium cap at 14.75 billion. So it's just under that 15 billion mark. It's trading today at $131. It just got an analyst upgrade to $165 from $150 from Cohen. Looking at the technicals and, and the chart and everything, it looks pretty strong. They've beat earnings consecutively uh, three different times, 37 cents in the last time. Their next, next expected earnings report is going to be on November 4th, so kind of coming soon here in the next month, so keep an eye on that. Now, this company, Corvo, has a lot of similarities to number two on this list. I won't mention the name so I don't spoil it, but that is also a major RF player. So both number three and number two, they're major RF players. Of course, RF, very important in 5G. Under its mobile pro product segment, the company manufactures a range of radio RF chips for a variety of mobile devices, including smartphones, wearables, laptops, tablets, and cellular-based applications for 5G and Internet of Things. 71.1% of its revenue is exposed to 5G. So if you're looking for kind of a true 5G play, this is one of those that has a pretty high concentration in 5G. Now, there are some arguments that I found online about who has better RF technology with BAW and SAW. I'm not an expert on those by any means, but the next stock does so. If you buy this stock and you look at the second stock, they have some similarities. You're gonna to have to kind of do some homework on your own. Um, they both have good RF technologies. And from what I found, they, you know, they're pretty competitive when it comes to that space. Now it does have a net debt position of $843.2 million, but its revenue has grown consistently over the past eight years with an average growth of 20.66%. So it is kind of an expensive stock. It would be kind of in that growth bucket. It is behaving pretty bullishly. The volume on it, a 90-day average volume is 1.3 million. So you know when you look at, for example, uh, Palantir today alone, this is the second day of trading of Palantir, they've traded 92 million shares already today. Um, looks like Palantir is down at $9.44. But they've, they've traded 92 million shares and th their 90 day average volume is 1.3 million. This is a mid cap stock. It's, you know, so it's one that just not as many people trade. It's not like a AMD or an Nvidia that everybody's constantly buying and knows a lot about. Next, I'm gonna get into some financials and more information, so stay tuned. Okay, I spent a lot of time researching this, more time than you want to listen to, so I'm just trying to cherry pick the highlights and one of the highlights that I found that I really thought I want to share is that on September 8th, they actually raised guidance, which obviously is very important. 
And if, the, if you raise guidance and you miss, that's very, very bad for earnings. So this can be, it can be a double-edged sword sometimes, but usually they do not raise guidance unless they're very confident. So generally speaking, they're usually gonna hit it. In fact, if they're raising guidance, a lot of companies will raise gui guidance and be conservative. They might even blow these numbers out of the water. No guarantee, but that's a chance. So prior, the revenue range was 925 to 955 million. Their updated range is 1 billion to 1.03 billion, so a modest increase. Gross margin, they're leaving at approximately 50%. They haven't made a change there. But the diluted earnings per share, they had prior at $1.90 on the midpoint of guidance, and now they're having $2.14 at the midpoint of guidance. It's probably because of just the increased demand and surge of 5G would be my guess. But something to keep an eye on, nonetheless, I think this could be very important coming with, with earnings right down the pipe here in November. So next I wanna cover their most recent earnings, which was back in July. So it's been a little bit of, a little bit of time. It's not really that relevant anymore, but it gives you an idea of where they're going. But just really quick. So first quarter for, for 2021, they had 787 million and their gross margin was 41.4%. Not bad at all. The point I wanna to get to on here is that their president and CEO, actually, he, here's a quote he said. He said, Corvo delivered an exceptional June quarter with revenue and earnings per share well above guidance. Obviously, that's a good thing, but listen to this. The Corvo team continues to operate very well in a challenging environment. We are supporting leading customers with best in class products and our technology investments are aligned with long-term market drivers in 5G handsets, infrastructure, defense, Wi-Fi 6, and Internet of Things. That's what you want to see. You know, if, if the CEO is coming out and making those statements in an earnings call, that's generally a good sign. Obviously, those are the secular growth trends that we want to be a part of. Next, I'm going to show you some of the products they sell on their website. Stay tuned. Okay, so products. Now... I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail with this, but what you need to know is that 71% of their business is focused on 5G equipment, but you can see they have amplifiers, products, transistors, duplexers, converters, integrated products, you know, Internet of Things controllers, optical, passives, power management, switches, all those different things. So I did my homework on this one. It looks really interesting. It's my number three for mid cap. It's got some decent growth. I think that it probably will perform better than the market. It's not going to necessarily be, you know, a Fastly that goes up 500% or anything like that. It's been around. A lot of these companies are established even though they're mid cap, but I do like the direction they're going, especially in the short term. I think there's a lot of potential for this one, even as a, a you know, a swing trade, maybe for six months. I think you might see some positive earnings from Corvo over the next couple quarters due to this huge super cycle in 5G. So check out Corvo. The stock ticker is QRVO. All right, number two, you probably knew this was coming because it's in my portfolio, it's Skyworks. Now this one does have that dividend, I promise. So this is a DJIF play. It's a price about the same as Corvo in that high, you know, 30, 31, 32 PE ratio. Corvo was a little bit higher. This one right now is about $150 a share. Cohen just upgraded it, which is funny because Cohen just upgraded Corvo as well. They upgraded this the same exact day. So this one they're upgrading to $155, which is actually only $5 higher than what we're at today. Although Piper Sandler also upgraded this one to $160, both, uh, well, overweight for the Piper Sandler and uh, outperform uh, for the Cohen. Now I've had this one in my portfolio for probably two years. So if you've watched any of my videos, you might've seen Skyworks before. This is another 5G type play. Um, it, it really deserves to be top of the list. It's a key smart smartphone and consumer electronics supplier. It's very similar to Corvo uh, because they focus on 5G and RF technology, but they do have some differences. The company has used its connectivity know-how to enter other markets, including smart home devices, which have become a big thing with Alexa devices and Google devices and so on. There's more and more of those coming with, you know, Nest products for your, uh, for your thermostat, for, you know, just various parts of the smart home uh, economy or smart home system, I guess is a better word. Um, so they, they are doing smart home devices. They're doing connected industrial equipment, medical devices as well. Uh, which is something I you know, didn't explore too much with Corvo. It has developed some of the basic components that, that power the next-gen 5G network. So this is, again, about 5G. Though it's, the, it's one of the smallest chip makers when you look at, you know, like Qualcomm's much bigger. It is smaller. Um, Skyworks has a healthy balance sheet to promote further growth. 
as the next wave of connectivity services come online. Now this one is actually bigger than Corvo. It's a $24.31 billion uh, medium cap. And the volume is slightly more at a 1.9 million uh, 90 day average volume. But you can see their volume for these two mid caps are of course much smaller than some of the large caps you see on a daily basis. Skyworks is a leading radio frequency RF supplier. So very much like Corvo, RF chips are used in all smartphones and communication devices. They're important for Internet of Things and for 5G. RF solutions are also utilized across other industries such as infrastructure and aerospace. Under its mobile segment, the company manufactures power amplifiers. So again, very similar front end modules. We saw some of the same stuff on the Corvo website and, and 5G wireless infrastructure equipment. Now, 73% of their revenue is exposed to 5G. So even more, almost the same. It was 71.1% for Corvo, 73% for Skyworks. So these first two are very much 5G plays in the mid cap space. And I think they have a lot of upside growth potential. Skyworks, I think, stands to gain massively. The, the specs required in 5G smartphones, including new bands and carriers, which create an increased need of these RF chips uh, for waveforms, modulations, and subcarrier spacing. This bodies extremely well for Skyworks, as it may mean it would need to start supplying up to twice as many RF chips as they are today. As an investor, that's definitely something that you like to see and like to read about. So. They have a really good presentation. Uh, Corvo didn't have nearly as cool graphics and things, so I'm gonna go to that next. Stay tuned, you're gonna wanna see this. Okay, this is from May of 2020. This is Skyworks connecting everyone and everything all the time. Um, this, this has a lot of good information and I can't go through it all, but I'll put a link in the video, so if you wanna check it out on your own, you can. But they have a very diverse geographic supply chain. You can see, um, all the different places they actually, so you've got Singapore, Japan, Mexico, you've got California, you've got Massachusetts, and you can see there's a little uh, kind of, you know, infographic or a uh, logo that shows like smart home here. This is for industrial, this is for autonomous, you know, et cetera. So it's kind of a neat little graphic. So here's some of their, it says serving customers across fast growing end markets. You can see everything from Microsoft to Cisco, Amazon, Ericsson, LG. You can see on, you know, Nintendo's on there, Google's on there. A lot of great names, BMW's on there, Mercedes, and so on, Honeywell. So good stuff there. They consider themselves at the forefront of connectivity. So you can see the old world on the left-hand side, you know, kind of <laughs> show some old, kind of headphones and like the phone in the middle. And now it's like the new world is connected to everything. So you see like your house is connected, your medical records are connected, you know, good, bad, and ugly. Everything is connected. Uh, your, your car, everything, your house content is exploding as performance demands intensify. So these guys are all about antenna tuners for smartphones, internet of things, critical network access points and so on. Re really cool slides though. And I like sharing these. 5G leverages new spectrum and vastly higher data rates. So you can see the, the 5G, the high data throughput, it says 10 to 100 times the speed of 4G. And if you watch some of my older videos from 2019, we talked about the same statistics, extremely low latency, enhanced efficiency, and so on and so forth. It's really gonna change the game as 5G rolls out. And it's been hyped for a long time, but it is finally here. You actually are seeing it. There's cities that actually are rolling it out you know, Apple's coming out with their 5G phones, it is coming. So you look at 5G as disruptive technology, disruptive technology here over and over again, new applications, new markets. You can see today on the left and then with 5G, how much more connected you can really be with your wireless devices. And uh, you know, this, is, this demographic here is showing that on 2G, they might only get $3 a phone. Now Skyworks is saying with 5G, it's gonna take 70 filters, 30 bands, you know, 75 TXRX filters, 30 switch throws, you know, 200, you know, stuff that I'm not even sure what some of those are. MIMO, we've talked about MIMO devices on the channel, but you see the difference, $18 for a 4G phone, which is still significant. Now you're talking about $25 because there's all these extra parts and components that have to go into these new phones. The connected car, I can't stress the importance of autonomous driving, it's coming. Not only are electric vehicles coming, but autonomous electric vehicles are coming. I have a video on the channel about autonomous driving stocks. And, you know, obviously that's old and some of those stocks might need to be updated. But I'm telling you, this is a big, big thing. 
it's going to be a huge secular growth trend. It's something that you want to have in your portfolio, you know, some sort of stock that, that hits this. And there's a lot of stocks, so it can be very hard to understand where to go. But you can see the Tesla logo over here. You got Audi, you got BMW, Mercedes, all the big, big names. And uh, Connected Car, it says pacing towards 2020 plus opportunity. You're going to start seeing this. And on, on the next uh, on the next pick, on the number one pick, I'm going to talk more about autonomous. So stay tuned. And that's going to show you some of the numbers and some of the stuff coming. But 2021 is going to be a big year for a lot of these, these chip makers and autonomous as well as 5G. So 5G creates significant infrastructure opportunity. You know, MIMO, we've talked about MIMO boxes with some of the uh, like Xilinx and some of the other ones that do MIMO boxes, small cells, indoor radios. You know, Cisco is going to have a piece of that pie. You know, that, price, that stock is beat down hard. And I'm telling you that Cisco at some point is going to have a piece of that pie. When we get out of COVID, I think that stock will recover. It's got a good balance sheet. It's got good management. It does have some, some things that will be needed in the United States infrastructure-wise for 5G. So I'm not telling you to go buy Cisco necessarily, but I just noticed the logo, and I do think that that one will recover with time. Our addressable markets will grow dramatically. You can see, you know, you're seeing the same things over and over, guys, but this is where it's at. Mobile, Internet of Things, automotive, engineering. That's what all of this, this technology is, is, is going into. Our strategic path. So you got mobile down here. You got tablets, smartphones, mobile office, and then Internet of Things, you're talking about broadband to home. You've got infotainment, you've got medical, you've got wearables, connected home, streaming video, everything in the Internet of Things, and then emerging. So your emerging market is going to be your artificial intelligence, your machine learning, your smart cities, your autonomous driving, taking that to the next level, robotics, taking it to the next level, virtual reality, augmented reality, all those different things. These guys are involved in all of these different secular growth trends. So... You know, you can see leading the 5G charge for Sky 5, BAW, I talked about in the last one, next phase of Internet of Things. So here's some, you know, some of the financials. You can see free, free, uh, free cash flow margin from 2013 has gone, you know, has improved up to 29% last year. You can see, you know, repurchase and dividends has increased, operating cash flow. The revenues from 2013 have increased as well. And I see a big year for them coming up here, I think, after COVID. I, I do think all these stocks have the ability to perform well and outperform the overall market in 2021. That's just my opinion, but that's what I see in my research. So uh, world-class financial performance. They're talking about 53% gross margin, a 40% operating margin. I mean, it's good stuff. The targeting return of 60 to 75% of free uh, cash flow to shareholders as a shareholder, I like the sound of that. I've been in this for a while. I'm up 100% on it, and I'm going to continue to hold it. So investment thesis, it's uniquely positioned to capitalize on 5G. It's a trusted technology leader in, in multiple wireless uh, transitions. They're broadening their reach across markets and customers. They're strategically positioned with world-class scale and technological depth. High profitable financial model with superior returns. Delivering long-term shareholder value. I mean doesn't get any better than that. That kind of sums it up for me. I think that's a, a great slide right there. So that is Skyworks Solutions. That's number two. Stay tuned for the number one pick. Number one is Marvel Technology. It's Marvell Technology Group Limited. This thing is at an all-time high. It's up 2% today. I should have <laughs> got into it sooner. It says a 19 P ratio in Fidelity. Assuming that's accurate, it's the cheapest of the three. It does pay a dividend, although albeit a very small one, at 0.6%. It also is showing the peg ratio of 0.5. So, you know, I'm not exactly sure if those numbers are accurate. And I haven't had a chance to completely dig into the financials of this yet. I wanted to get this video to you right away. But assuming that fidelity is accurate on that, that 19 P ratio and that 0.5 peg ratio looks really good. Uh, overall, though, I looked at the financials uh, just from a high level and the earnings report and it looked good. This is really about getting in front of this stock because I see an opportunity in the next year or two. And I'm going to read... A couple of different things here. This is from an interview, and this is from the CEO. Now, Mar Narvell has a long-term partnership with Arm. If you remember, Arm just was it's being acquired by Nvidia, and they have a long-term partnership with with Arm. Marvell, early Arm partner, their technology is embedded into almost everything that they do. Same with Cavium, which Marvell acquired. 
And that was an acquisition for cloud, for data center, Internet of Things, and 5G. And they're basically industrial Internet of Things. It's called Cavium, okay? So they do chips for networking, communication, and storage. The company's been around for 25 years, but they reinvented themselves with a new leadership team about three to four years ago. And the leadership team is legit from what I can tell. The CEO speaks well. I looked at a couple of the profiles on their website as well as LinkedIn. And it was impressive to me. So they set out three to four years ago to transform the company into a long-term player in the data infrastructure opportunity. They call, they call it the data infrastructure opportunity, which includes 5G. We've talked about earlier, of course, cloud autonomous. So again, the secular growth trends that we want to be focused on, these guys are basically, their management team is saying, this is our laser focus. Also, another thing to keep in mind with these guys is it's not a big part of their business right now, but automotive and autonomous vehicles could suddenly get hot, according to the CEO. They have a small percentage in automotive. They have design wins in 16 car OEMs that start this year at the end of 2020 and then go into 2021. So these are basically 16 new designs that are going to be built that these guys have awards to. They won the rights to for their chips. Signs, the situation, uh, there are signs basically that the situation is improving. Marvell is positioned very well for 5G as well, just like the first two that we talked about. Marvell is working with every, every major telco. So they're working with all the major tel telecommunications. They even were a partner of Huawei. Of course, that has had some challenges because of the, the China tensions. And so the China tensions really squashed that, according to the CEO. And Cavium had a win at Samsung. So what happened was, is they acquired Cavium. They already had a win at Samsung. And then from their own hard work and effort, they basically have won these other contracts. So they also, they also acquired another company called Avery Semi. And now it, basically they're a major player at all the major telcos. It says diversity of customers and products, all of the key elements of data processing. They're differentiated to other markets. And also, he said in the interview that... The company is now exposed to 5G across all geographics worldwide. And that is really powerful. They have an improved balance sheet since joining the company, the new CEO and the management. And they, one of the ways they did this, from 2019, they were really busy. They actually sold one of their companies. They did a divestiture where they sold their Wi-Fi group to NXP Semiconductor. And that closed actually in December of 2019. And they used the money from that to fund two key purchases, and they still had money left over to strengthen their balance sheet. So that was really good. So they did, one, they did two acquisitions in 2019 and one diverse, divestiture. So they did all three of those transactions in one year in 2019. I think that's positioned them very well. COVID kind of slowed down some of their plans, and I think 2021 could be a very good year for them. Um, they are a leading company in data infrastructure, and they're a great 5G play. And I want to show you a couple more things on the website. Stay tuned. So really fast, I just want to show you the investor relations. Here is the second quarter fiscal year. We talked a little bit about financials earlier. So in Q2, they, had, they just had their earnings here not too long ago. This was August 27th, so uh, about a month ago. Their Q2 revenue was $727 million. The Q2 gross margin was 49.4%, which is really good. Um, they have cash and short-term investments of 382 million. So some of the, the outlook, basically, revenue is expected to be 700. So this is for the third quarter. This is kind of their guidance. Revenue is expected to be 750 million, plus or minus 5%. Gross margins expected to be 51.4%. Um, and then the diluted income loss per share is expected to be four cents. It's a positive four cents a share. So. This company is going through a metamorphosis, a transitional type phase. I do think that they're positioned very well for 2021. If you look, this is a little bit older. This is from 2018, the end of 2018. Back then, though, when they did this acquisition with Cavium, it talked about you know the complete, the most complete infrastructure and portfolio. So there were storage, networking, processing, security, and connectivity. But I want to show you really fast some of the customers. So assuming that they're what the CEO is saying on this interview is that they still have a very good relationship with ARM. Okay, of course, ARM is going to be acquired. Hopefully, it gets approved and everything gets finalized with NVIDIA, 
which means that Marvell will actually be a partner of NVIDIA, which I think would be huge. Um, in addition to that, they're already working with Microsoft, with Google, Cisco, Ford, Intel, Facebook, Lenovo, Bosch, Samsung, Audi, on and on and on, Palo Alto. Hey, look, a VIP. There's a, you can't see it actually. So behind my, I'm, I'm actually getting notifications right now on Discord. And this is a good segue because I'm done with the top three and I want to thank you for your time. So I'm getting messages up here in the top right. My, my, my face is covering it from the camera because it's behind the camera spot. But uh, if you haven't uh, considered joining Patreon, definitely check it out. We've got a Discord and those are the notifications I'm getting right now from my VIP group in Discord. Take a look, it's the new month, it's October 1st. So, you know, if you're gonna join, they always charge when you join and then they charge the first of every month. So it's a great time to, to get the max uh, bang for your buck if you join today on October 1st or any time at the beginning of the month. We also do have a free Facebook group you can check out. Go to Facebook, type in Fired Up Wealth. There's a public page. Go ahead and hit like and follow that page. And then you can also join a, join a private group. You just have to fill out a few questions to get in there. But this is a series, as I mentioned a couple times in the video. So please do subscribe. Click on the subscribe button. Click on the bell to get notifications. I'm going to be doing a couple more of these semiconductor videos. It's a very good space. It's something that you should be probably invested in, I think, in my opinion. And um, look forward to seeing you on the next one. So appreciate your time and attention. Have a great rest of your day. Take care.